Good morning. Is this on? Check, check. Is this on? Here we go. I have to check it every week. Everybody doing okay? I'm doing really, really well. I just want to say I'm a 90, 1999 graduate of Florida State University, and I don't know what that means to you other than the game last night, uh, beating the daylights out of Clemson. So I just want to recognize all the Clemson fans. If you'd stand up. Okay. Got one. All right. Not even that. She wouldn't. Are you going to stand up? Do it, Blake. All right, that's all right. Well, here's what happened. I had all these hooligans at halftime show up thinking the game was over, I guess, and uh, came over, and it was good. It was great people, but they uh, it came a little too soon because we came back, and I just want to say that's the gospel right there. I mean, you know, when you're at your weakest, you know, God shows up, you know, that's the whole message here. So uh, I just wanted to point that out that uh, what revolution is doing, not tries to do, we are doing is moving people from where they are to where God wants them to be. So in that case, we're trying to move Clemson fans from where they are to where God wants them to be. <laughs> the Lord's team, Florida State Seminoles, right? Uh, so I just wanted you to know that in case you didn't. Uh, yeah. We're, we're uh, in a Samson series, and uh, we're calling it Dangerous. We're calling it Dangerous. And, man, people really responded. I, we're going at this as, man, what, what do we want our crowd to hear? What do we want people that are coming to church? We know we're drawing people that that hopefully we're drawing people that, man, they've never been to church before or they haven't been in a long time or maybe they've been burned or maybe God's sending us people that are very seasoned in their faith and they want to come help us grow a church. And we're uh, next week, by next week, we'll be officially one year old. And, man, that's a great feat. That's a big deal. You know, if you're not used to church world stuff, man, uh, it's hard to plant a church, and most of them fail with, before the first year. And it's, it's and uh, man, this God's just really opened up doors for us here at Revolution Church to be able to act out on our faith. And man, we want to plug you in, and we feel like, man, if we can just uh, get our paws on you and 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 unleash the potential, which is one of our core values here. We think that everybody brings something to the table. Everybody can be effective. Okay, to reach people for Christ, and people are discovering that, and they're moving on that. And it's beautiful to watch. So that's what's been going on. I want to kind of catch you up. So, man, if this is your first week, and or you hadn't been here in a while, or whatever it might be, that you would kind of know what's going on. And we started a series. It's uh, in, in Judges chapter thirteen. Man, it it can really tell its own story. It doesn't need. We just could read it, and it would be life changing for you. But we know that that before he was even born, uh, uh, somebody named Samson. His name means sun or sunlight. Okay, it means you have influence. You're noticeable. He, uh, an angel of the Lord came to his parents and said, you know, the son you're going to have is a big deal. He's going to have so much potential. Uh, God's got amazing things for him. He's going to begin the work of delivering uh, God's people from the Philistines, which are the enemy. The Philistines are enemy. They're, those are bad guys, okay? And it's going to start with you, parents. So that first week, man, we had a lot of parents. They came up to me afterwards or the next week, and they said, you know what? I kind of blew it as a parent. I'm older now. Or I'm blowing it as a parent. I'm not doing that good a job. I know I'm not doing what God's called me to do. And they just wanted to talk about that a little bit. And it's not really the response that we, I really expected from uh, reading a story about Samson because we got this idea this Sunday school mentality about Samson and he's just a big strong guy and we should be like him and man actually uh, the Lord put this in here so we wouldn't be like him so we could learn from his life okay and that's what we're doing and so turns out man they did a really good job they took it seriously as parents we're gonna we're gonna start this thing called a Nazarite vow it's gonna be very important that that right when he's born that he begins this Nazarite vow and it really means three things it means hey he can never touch alcohol okay God called him specifically not to touch alcohol or dead things or to ever get his hair cut ever okay some people would take in these days would take a Nazarite vow it might last a year two three depending on how long the Lord told him to do it but they said his is a lifelong commitment and people are going to be able to tell because of where he positions himself not around alcohol not around dead things and they're going to be able to see visibly with his hair being long and, and, and into seven braids or however he wore it. Uh, they're going to be able to tell that he is committed to God. He's a very frustrating character because what we see in starting in uh, Judges 14 is we see him making a lot of wrong turns. A lot, a lot like we do. We, we, some of you have already made a commitment to God. And, and we all can relate to this aspect of sense where we make wrong decisions. And even worse than that are just as bad as our own decisions. That the sad, some of the saddest decisions in the Bible is where people did not consult the Lord. They didn't even consider. They, they, they went from face value. What, how can this better my situation? How is my plan better than what God's got for me? And God wants to know, man, he, his plans 
or he, he wants us to be so effective. He wants us to have such impact and influence, more than we could even imagine. And so we got real frustrated in Judges 14 when he just kept making the wrong decision. He had abandoned his commitment to God. He had abandoned what God had created him for, for things he thought, for desi desires he had, like uh, lust and pride, and, and he would act out on those things. And man, you could see his world really start to crumble on him. And, uh, and at the end last week, we, we saw him, he picked a woman and she must have been hot, like a 12 on a scale of 1 to 10, and he just saw her. He began to see things, not like God saw things. And what I told last week, and it's the last thing I'm going to say to catch us up, is, look, I told the end of the story, I did the, the faux pas thing, and I said, hey, at the end of the story, he gets his eyes gouged out, and he's in bondage to the enemy. It's bad. I told him that. I said he lost his vision. He lost his sight. But I said, you know, what I really think was he lost his vision, that what, the vision God had placed in his life and the sight to be able to see things uh, uh, from God's perspective. He lost that way early, way early. And we, we talked about how that had done it, and we're going to look at that more today. But he wound up trying to marry this woman. Uh, and because he didn't surround, because he wasn't seeing things clearly, he didn't surround himself with people that God would have him surrounded with. He went into enemy territory, the enemy, the people that, that don't serve, serve our God. As a matter of fact, they hate our God. And against everybody that told him better, he went ahead and was going to get connected with somebody. And, and Scripture is very clear. Man, if you're getting involved with somebody, man, they, they have to be a believer. Up front of you, all these things start to, to pop up. And... Uh, so he went to this wedding where he had alcohol, he had a big keg party, and uh, he wasn't supposed to touch that, but he kept surrounding himself with people and circumstances uh, that God didn't place him in, and he had to fight battles that he wasn't meant to fight, okay? So he, the bride, is so, he was so disconnected that the enemies were part of his, uh, his groomsmen, okay? And he kind of made a bet with them. He tried to taunt the enemy a little bit. And he gave them this riddle because they didn't have anything else to do So back in those days. So a lot of times they would, they discovered theater and plays, you know, like that. Because they didn't have cable, didn't have college football, go Seminoles. And so what they did was they, would, they, they really loved riddles and trying to solve riddles. And so because he bet clothes, 30 pieces of clothes, he got mad. He started, listen, he started to be uh, driven by his emotions rather than being, be spirit-led. And that's Chinese to some people, and I hope it's clear today. Listen, that's what we do. We are emotion-driven, and that's what Samson was. When things make us mad, we get mad. We don't, we don't know any other way to, to respond. But when we begin to let God start to move in our life, and, and I don't want to sound too generic, we start to position ourselves to where God would have us position and respond when he'd have us respond. He starts surrounding you with people. He starts showing things to you in scripture and through what people say and what's sung on stages and I mean, he starts to place you man and you start to be led so these circumstances listen you're better able to see what God wants you to do in those circumstances okay but what he did he got really mad he got really really mad because they figured out that riddle he got so mad that he went to the next town over and he beat these people to death 30 people and took their clothes to pay off the debt but when he came back when he came back uh, he, he, he got really ticked off from what happened. So that's what we're going to do today. And I got a lot of application points today. We're really going to move quickly today. Uh, or I would talk about Florida State a whole lot more. Um, but I want you to hear the application points. I feel like it, it definitely does something for me. I think it will for you. And here's the first one. The first one is this, that our enemy makes strong people weak. This is what you're going to get today. You're going to figure out, if nothing else, that our enemy makes strong people weak. But our God makes weak people strong. Listen, if you feel like you're behind the eight ball, like you uh, have no hope, man, there's, there's nothing to reach for, that's exactly where God gets glory. Okay, when you're backed into a corner, he loves to operate from that position, okay? And we're going to see that God, if we'll allow ourselves to be weak, that, and we know that we're weak and we present ourselves to God, that he loves to make weak men strong. Okay, that's what we're doing today. So in Judges chapter 15, are you still with me? Yeah, I need some help this morning. I think I got about two hours sleep because of the Seminoles and caffeine. Okay, chapter 15, it says later on at the time of wheat harvest, wheat, it tells us when this is happening. It's saying this is a real scenario. This isn't just a story. This is real. 
It says, Samson took a young goat when he went to visit his wife. He had left and did all that stuff and came back a time later. And he came with him with a goat in tow to visit his wife. And he said, I'm going to my wife's room. But her father would not let him go in because he, he left abruptly. And what he thought he was going to do, guys, and this is not a good thing. I don't think it helps when you, when you present a goat to your wife. I'm just not sure what that came from. But he tried to go in with a, a present to her and say, I'm going to go to her room. And you know what that means, you know? Now, chicky, wow, wow. But the dad said, I can't let you do that. I thought you were mad. I thought you hated her. I thought you were displeased with her. And you left. Out of anger, you missed an opportunity because you let your emotions lead you. And I thought that you didn't want her. I thought that, that something was displeasing about her. So I had this party going on. So listen, some of those people that are your friends, your enemies, one of them married her. I gave them to her. But look, I know you're all about the lust. I know you're all about the way you see things. Guys, you know what I'm talking about? When uh, you look at people, you don't know her sister, but look, she's really good looking, probably better looking. You can have her because we know you're just about looks. We know that you just lust a lot. So, hey, just take her is what he's saying. And, man, he got so mad. And this is the point I want you to catch is our disobedience results in being controlled by your circumstances. Your disobedience results in you being controlled by your circumstances. We're going to see that Samson's anger over and over again, his emotions being led by that, not having God's power on him and consulting God and being responding to what God's telling him to do is, is going to cost him over and over again. Because, look, um, anger is a default emotion. I don't know how many people in here study that. Some of you are in college and you're studying psychology and things. But, listen, it's a default emotion, especially in men. Some guys will relate to this. You stub your toe. I mean, you're mad. You're not just hurting. You're mad. Sometimes, guys, when we get embarrassed, embarrassed. I tripped on the stage this morning. I mean, almost, almost did a face plant, but uh, I'm half ninja, so I caught myself, and I had a whole audience here, and, and the only thing I hurt was my ego, and they laughed at me, and I remembered each person that laughed because I'm going to get them back one by one. But uh, look, some people, when they get embarrassed, they get mad. That's their default emotion, man. If we don't keep that in check, and so many guys, they come to say, man, I'm struggling. My kids are distant from me. My wife has checked out on me. She's there, but she can't get close to me. My anger has got the best of me. Guys, I hope you'll relate to that. It's very important before you start a relationship, and if you're in it, it's never too late to say, God, I need help with those emotions. And the only thing to do to replace that anger is to replace it with God and what he wants to pour in your life. You know what I'm talking about? So some women are like, amen. They want to say amen. They want to give you the elbow, but they're scared you might get mad. Please work on that, guys. Guys, you draw with your calmness and the way you respond to circumstances. Listen, when you're able to do that, you draw people to Jesus. It's things that usually make you mad, make people mad. It draws people in when we can manage that. So, uh, but when we're disobedient, when people are starting to, they, they come up and this happens, it happens to me occasionally. I feel disconnected from God. I feel a little numb. I'm not sure what God wants from me. I don't see clearly what that is. Okay, and sometimes God just doesn't reveal it to you, but sometimes we, it's because of our disobedience. There's something, there's some area that we're not fully given to God and we start to feel distant and disconnected and we don't know how to respond to God. So, let's read on. It says, Samson said to them, this time I have the right to get even with the Philistines. He's operating out of that uh, uh, emotion-driven response. And here's what he does. I'm going to save you this. You can go home and read this. You won't believe it. He took 150 pairs, that's 300 foxes, and tied their tails together with a, with a rope and put a torch on it. It's in here. Listen, and he was so mad. He's going to hit them where it hurts, and that's their crops and their vineyards and their wheat fields. And, man, you know foxes, they're just going nuts, man. They're just running, uh, trying to get away from this torch. And, man, he burns the whole place down. So he responds in revenge and in anger. And so the Philistines were very, really upset with this. And, and they go down. I'm, I'm trying to save some time here. It says, um, he says, I'm not going to stop till I get my revenge, verse 7. He says, uh, he attacked them viciously and saw, slaughtered many of them. And he went down and stayed in the cave in the rock of Edom. And he's on the run. Okay? He slaughtered them. He, he was, uh, was killing people. He tore them from limb, limb to limb. He's this big, strong guy. So the Philistines went up and camped in Judah, uh, spreading out near Lehi. The in, when we taunt the enemy like that, he's coming after you. He's coming after you. And he, it says that uh, the people there said, why have you come to fight us? And they said, we've come to take Samson. We know he's hiding out here. 
we've come to get him. We're going to surround him. And it really put them in a bad spot. And it said, then 3,000 men from Judah went down to the cave and said to Samson, look, don't you realize the Philistines are after you? And this puts us in a bad spot. And man, you know, why are you doing this? And he said, look, I'm merely doing to them what they did for, to me. I'm just getting them back for what they did. Does that sound familiar in relationships? A lot of our communication with our spouses can be, hey, I'm going to make you hurt the way you've made me feel. And it is never a win. It's always best. It's always best to concede and to look for love and not tit for tat. And he says this, he says, uh, they said to him, we've come to tie you up. Now we know you're big and strong and you can really body slam us and rip our arms out. But look, swear to us, swear to me that you won't kill, kill me uh, yourselves. Agreed, agreed. So they said, we'll, we'll, we'll take you in and we'll present you, we'll kind of tie you up. And he did. In verse 16 it says, as he approached Lehi, the Philistines came toward him, shouting, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, upon him in power. And the ropes on his arms began to snap like charred flax. Just like we weren't even there. And he started beating the, the, the dog poop out of him. And the bindings dropped from his hands. He picked up a jawbone. He, this guy is ruthless. His anger is taking over. And man, he's doing things that nobody's ever seen. He's really having a fit with this jawbone of a donkey. It's recently dead. It means the teeth are sharp. And it's not going to break when he hits him. It's going to slice him. It's going to hurt him. It's going to gash him. And so out of anger... His, his situation just seems to snowball, doesn't it? When we act out of our emotions like this. So what we see here is this is what he said. He said all that to say this. Samson said after he beat them all down, he says, with a donkey's jawbone, I have made donkeys of them. And uh, the version we have here is trying to be nice. It's donkey. The other word for donkey. He's trying to say, look, I made them look like idiots. I made donkeys out of them. And what this is, is this is the worst form of pride. He had accomplished something, even though he's being disobedient. That's where some of us get in trouble. We get a pattern of being dis disobedient and God doesn't expose us. You know those things that you probably wouldn't tell anybody that you're involved in, the habits or the thoughts that you have? But yet we act on those and, and we're, we're not exposed for so long. What that is is God's grace. God's allowing grace to keep us safe and from being exposed. And he's doing this over and over again. And, and when a situation where he's bailed out, God has, has kept him safe again. God's kept him safe and he's taking credit for this. He says, I have made donkeys out of them with a donkey's jawbone. I have killed a thousand men. Not God has protected me. His perspective's gone. His vision's gone. So here's the thing. I want you to remember this. Pride is always born out of insecurities. This isn't going to pop up. I forgot to give it. Pride is always born out of insecurities. Okay, our pride keeps us distant from God. Some people, man, I know, I, saw, I watch them and I, I see them, they want to give their life to Christ so bad. But there's a pride issue involved. They're scared, what are people going to think when I come talking about Jesus? What if I come talking about life change that only God can provide? I'm not sure I'm ready for that. And when that's going on, that means that you think you're the star. You think you're the, this, this shows about you. And that all you can result to is pride. But when God gives you, you begin to let God lead you by the Spirit. And you just respond to what He says to you. Listen, it's because you recognize that God is the star. He, this is all about Him. And so you don't have to operate from the angle of what do other people think. But you have the freedom now. I want to operate from what God thinks of me. Does that make sense? Okay. The opposite is true of the flip side of, of pride too is, you know, I just don't want to ask for help. I don't want people to know my circumstances. I don't want to ask for, I'm in such a need. That is also a pride that is offensive to God. Listen, I, we encourage our people here, we are going to go through difficult times financially and relationship wise. And we're trying to create a culture here where we expect that to happen and we're looking at that as an opportunity that God allows us to love on each other. We can demonstrate to the world that you know pride is a real issue and we don't let that affect us because I could be out of a job tomorrow okay and so could you and so we keep our pantry try to keep it packed full of food so that when people hit those hard times we can we, we promote transparency here okay and that's how we're called to live our life as Christ followers okay so uh, here's the next point it says if you let your needs, if you let your needs drive you to God, God will meet your deepest needs. Try to remember that. 
if you let your needs, the needs that you have, the things that hold you hostage and keep you handcuffed, keep you paralyzed, keep you from moving forward, if you let your needs drive you to God and recognize what is God doing this, why is he allowing this, if you allow and get that perspective that God is drawing me near to him, he's trying to make major change in my life, there's a promise of God, God will meet your deepest needs, not your deepest wants, but your deepest needs. If you take those to him, he responds, and that's what I love about God is he loved to re loves to respond to prayer. Several times this week, three or four big prayers in people's lives and mine answered. He wants to meet those needs. They're important to him. If it's important to you, it's a distraction in your life and it keeps you from God, he wants you to place it on his lap. He wants to respond. He wants to show that how committed he is to you and how faithful he is to you. So, he lets his need drive him to God. Listen to this. Because he was very thirsty, he cried out to the Lord, You have given your servant a great victory. Must I die now of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised? Uncircumcised. Ask your mama. Uh, it means that they're not believers. These people that are your enemies, God. He said, Then God opened up the hollow place in Lehi and water came out of it. And here's the point. Life was over for him. He knew, uh-oh, all of these people are coming after me. I'm thirsty. I'm tired. This situation looks hopeless. But God, deliver me. I count on you. And what happened when he prayed that? It says that when Samson drank, his strength returned to him. His strength returned to him and he was revived. So here's the point. When you, when you have that deep need and you take it to God and you finally turn to him in prayer. He hadn't prayed in a long time. He hasn't recognized God in a long time that we've read. But when he did, almost immediately in his case, is that his strength was returned to him. And he could be, he, could, he had life come back into him. And he can be who God had called him to be, which was a judge. And not Judge Judy, Judge Wapner, but God would raise people up like he did in his case. When the angel of the Lord said, man, we're going we're gonna to raise him up to be close to God and, um, uh, and, and in military to deliver us from the enemies. And that's exactly what happened here. And here's what I want you to catch before we move on. We're moving quick. Verse 20. Listen, I want you to pause for a moment. You've got to catch this. Some of y'all are veterans of the Bible. you like, got it all memorized. Way to go. And I want you to catch this. Samson led Israel for 20 years in the days of the Philistines. He led after that moment, God in that moment, revived and refreshed him. He went to God and he gave him... He, and, he, and he turned, in that moment, he turned back to God. And for all apparent purposes, we see that uh, he led with faithfulness for 20 years. He did an awesome job of what God come to do for 20 years. He led, he had just experienced who God was, experienced what God had for him, and he was revived and refreshed. And man, it, it, it summarizes it. It says he was doing what God called him to do. Now, we could almost end the story there and say, way to go, Samson, way to turn to God with your stuff. I mean, he did. And some people blow right through that. They don't even know that that's there. They don't remember seeing it. But it's one of the bright points of all these chapters about Samson. Is he led after this, after blowing it, after blowing it, he turned to God and he was revived. God gave him a new passion. And that's available to you. God wants to renew you. He sees your circumstances. They're hopeless. And it seems like there's no hope. But when you turn to God and lay it on his lap and, and present it to him, he demonstrates his faithfulness to him. And so for 20 years, we looked at he led them successfully. But, big but, all right? We're about to see something very, very tragic. We're going to see somebody who has give, been given so much God-given potential. We're going to see him absolutely blow it. After 20 years, after 20 years of just doing what God's called him to do, we're going to see this happen. And, and you know, it, it made me think, how does somebody end up with their eyes gouged out in front of their enemy shackled and everybody laughing at him and he's embarrassed and humiliated how do you get to that point from success God given potential because God created you for a purpose and a plan and I personally believe it's to impact the people that you're surrounded That's, that means your family that means this community okay God has is orchestrating something in your life if you let him but we, we look at this and he ruined it listen not all at one time, but one step at a time. That's what we're going to see here. One step at a time. And then we're going to watch it unfold in Judges 16. The Bible says one day. And that can never really be good in the Bible. Another place in the Bible is talks about David and Bathsheba. This is kind of rated R. So teenagers kind of close your ears. I'm not going to say everything. 
But David, God, same thing. It, it starts out with a story. One day. And David is King David, and he sent all his people to war, but he's walking around on his, on his balcony. He can see down the rooftops, and people would put bathtubs on their, their ceilings, I mean on their roofs, so the sun would kind of warm it up. And he caught the eye. Some says one day. He had led faithfully, but one day something happened. It could happen at any time. Sometimes we think we're um, insulated from things happening. We're all susceptible to to sin creeping up in our life. And it says one day, and here it says one day again. It says one day Samson went to Gaza where he saw a prostitute. He kind of had a relapse here. He went to spend the night with her. And Gaza is about 25 miles away. If you re research it, you can see how long that 25 miles is. It's about 56,249 steps. That's how many steps it is. Listen, to Gaza, enemy territory. He had to take a lot of steps a lot of steps walking towards the enemy where he wasn't supposed to go and away from what God had him do. A lot of steps, 56,249, give or take, right? So that's what's going on here. And here's the problem is people don't, I don't think people ever, ever set out to say, you know, uh, I'm going to really get so in bondage to sin that, you know, I'm just going to intentionally do that. They do it one step at a time. One step at a time. And this is what it says. The people of Gaza were told, Samson is here. We hate that punk. He's really messed us up over the past 20 years. We've been wanting to get him. Because he's just been a thorn in our side. We found out he's here. So they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the city gate. Most cities were surrounded with a gate. It's for protection from the enemy. Okay? It's for protection. It says they, they stayed up all night. They, they made no move during the night saying... At dawn, we will kill him. But Samson lay there only until the middle of the night. Then he got up and took hold of the doors of the city, which a lot of commentaries say that that was about 700 pounds. Okay, so he, could, he was lifting 700 pounds of, his, of the gate. He tore it off and carried it up a hill. And he's taunting the enemy here. He's going into their, their area. Okay, he's in Gaza. He's taking their fence off. He didn't have to do that. He is taunting them. And it's so reflective of what goes on in so many people. My life and people's life, we know we feel like, man, I can get away with sin. I can, you know, there's just, I can, I can kind of flirt with sin. I can flirt with things that God told me to not to even touch or to go near. And he's doing it. He tore, tore with, together with the two posts and tore them loose, bar and all, lifted them on his shoulders, and he carried them back to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. And he's taunting them. And what he's saying is, you're not safe. You're not safe. I'm taunting you. You're not safe and you're not secure. You think you are, but you're not. So, and so many times we underestimate the enemy. We underestimate the things that God protects us from by, by, through his word and says, you know, don't mess with this. Or what he tells you uh, in response to your prayers in your prayer time. What not to do, because the Bible is very clear on what, that, that our enemy is like a, it's not like a kitten, it's, it's, like a, it's like a lion, top of the food chain, it wants to devour you. It doesn't just want to inconvenience you and give you a bad day, pee in your cornflakes, it wants to ruin your life. So many guys are just overtaken, even some women now, are overtaken through pornography. I mean, they never meant for it to be that, I know that. When you talk to them, they'll tell you, I, I never meant for it to get to that point. Okay, but there was some need they felt that they have and it just started to overtake them. Financially, people don't go set out to be in financial ruin. Man, I want to have a I want marriage. I want to argue a lot. A lot about money. A lot about money. And nobody sets out to do that. But God teaches us how to manage our money. And when we get outside of that, it's one step at a time, one decision at a time, we start to hand that over. And the enemy wants to devour you. Not just make it to where you got an extra bill that comes in, but that you're shackled by that circumstance. Okay, that, remember disobedience. Disobedience uh, shackles you. It holds you hostage. All right. It says, sometime later, he fell in love with a woman in the, in the Valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah, not the lady on the radio. I wish it was her. I think it was her. This is the third time he's been messing around with the Philistine woman. The third time. This is my point. Three times. Stay away from the enemy. Don't connect with the enemy in, in, in marriage. Don't 
don't marry people that are unbelieving. And here he is doing it for the third time. It reinforces what I said earlier. Is we think we can get away from that. We think we keep being disobedient. And in some, some, some way there's not uh, repercussions from God. And, and it says the rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, Look, see if you can lure him into showing us his secret to his strength. Because we can't stand this guy. We hate his stinking guts. We want him dead. We want to embarrass him first. But we need your help in getting him. See if you can talk him into it. See how he got his strength. So Delilah said to Samson, tell me a secret of your great strength and how you can be tied up and subdued. I lost my woman voice last time. I'm not doing that again. I got picked at. So I don't do girl voices anymore. It sounded too good. So I'm going to save you some time. I want you, really want you to go back and read it. So he went through three different things that he told her and none of them were really the truth. We said, look, First he says, you know, okay, if anyone ties me with, with seven fresh thongs. Now, I didn't feel comfortable saying that, so we're going to stick to the other version and say straps. Let's just say straps. If anyone ties me with seven fresh straps they have not, that have not been dried, I'll become as weak as any other man. So she really thought she had that, so she, she tied him up with the straps. And she yelled, she said, the, 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 the Philistines, the Philistines are upon you. Uh, Samson and they came running out and he popped up and broke right through it and she started to pout girls women some people think that's a spiritual gift it's not of the pouting and nagging it's not okay repent not my wife she's awesome I'm talking about the rest of y'all right. then she said look you're not being truth with me you're not you don't love me. Tell me what it really is. And she says, you know, if anyone ties me securely with new ropes, ones that's brand new, never been used, it's like if they tie me up with that, I'll be as weak as any other man. So, of course, she jumped out, hey, the Philistines. And he jumped up and popped him right off. She said, you're not being truthful with me. You, 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 you said, you said. And so he says, okay, I'll tell you, if you weave the seven braids of my hair, my head into the fabric on the loom, and tighten it with a pen, whatever that is. She said, if you do, he says, if you do that, I'll become as weak as any other man. He's telling this to the enemy. This is the enemy woman. He's telling her, telling her things. And so she said it again. She said, Samson, the Phil Philistines are among you. Like, like she's doing him a favor and he pops up and poof, he gets out of it. So listen to this, guys. I know some of y'all are just waking up. And some of you are going to say, man, I'm going to memorize this verse. It says, with such nagging, she prodded him day after day until he was, listen, is it on the screen? Tired to death. <laughs> to was tired to death. I'm like, man, amen, brother. That's my scripture for the week. Yeah, I got some clapping. Yeah, he's going home by himself today. Yeah, can he come over and eat? She prodded him. <laughs> I feel sorry for him. <laughs> That's the only scripture you'll ever memorize, right? So, because of that, because he continually exposed himself to the enemy, he was worn down, and this is what he says. So he told her everything. No razor has ever been used on my head because I have been a Nazarite, which means set apart to God since birth. I haven't touched anything dead. I wasn't supposed to, but I, I've, I wasn't supposed to even touch or be around alcohol. And I was never supposed to cut my hair. But listen, if somebody cuts my hair, if my head were shaved, my strength would leave me. And I would become as weak as any other man. It's almost like I thought for a second. This is different. This is different. I thought he was going to say, God is my strength. But he said his strength was in his hair. He misplaced and did not recognize to her what really gave him his strength. He gave all the credit to his hair all of it. He says, my power's in my hair. And when Delilah saw that he told her everything, she sent word, said, come back once more. He has told me everything. So that night, uh, the rulers of the Philistines returned with silver in their hands. They paid her off. Having put him to sleep on her lap, she called them to shave his seven braids of his hair. And so they began to subdue him and the strength, and his strength left him. And I wonder how many people out of disobedience are doing battle every day. Every day in their own strength. I think it's rampant. I think people are hustling. I think they're putting their, their, their hope and confidence in their own hustle, the hustle of others. But, but out of disobedience, they are experiencing things they weren't meant to experience because they are not tapping into the power of God that is for them. 
it is for them. So, um, and this is, this is the other point I want to make, is your strength is not strong enough. Your strength is not strong enough. It is for so many things in your life. Listen, some of you guys, you lead very well at work. Some of you are supervisors. You do a great job. Some of you are very committed to your hobby that you've got. You, you, you are so passionate about it. But listen, you don't lead your home. Some of you are in that boat. And you, it makes you weak. Listen, God wants to make your, weak, your weakness your strength. And what we need men, not just in this church, but in this community, we need strong men to lead, to lead their wives. They want it to be done. Sometimes they don't seem like it, but they, they desire from you. If it's from a, a spirit-led, if, man, if it's from God, they will take it. They will respond to that because God wants them to respond to it. They want you to lead. They want you to lead spiritually in the home. So Samson, Samson assumed that his disobedience wouldn't, would never cost him because it says this. It says, uh, before... Uh, when they called upon they ran in it says here's what he said he woke from his sleep and thought I'll go out as before and shake myself free but he did not know that the Lord had left him and here's what I said earlier so many times because we've gotten out of situations before on our own strength we think that it can happen again but listen one day enough's enough number one from God I mean there's a certain point where grace did not work for you you did not respond. You didn't recognize and respond to his grace. So he has to allow for the purpose to draw you near to him, not kick you while you're down. He allows you to go through things. This is enough, enough. You've gotten out so many times before, but not this time. Listen, the Bible is very clear. It says your sins will find you out. And that's God trying to pursue you and slow you down and draw you to him. Okay? That's what that's for. So... It says, then the Philistines seized him. They took control of him. They gouged out his eyes and took him down to Gaza, binding him with bronze shackles. They set him in, uh, to grinding in the, in the prison like an animal. Okay? Like an animal. That's what they would do to ox, oxen. They would hook it up or, or any other big old beast, and they would just crush grain and walk around in big circles and do that. So they had him grinding in the prison. And, you know, how did this happen? How did this this happened all at once and it didn't it was one step at a time and I want to be honest with you and I want you to be honest because listen you're only as listen you're only as strong as you are honest about where you are where where are you where have you stepped away from God where are you have you stepped I don't want you to talk it out loud you don't have to say it I believe God I don't know what it is I believe God it came right up for you there's an area of your life where you've stepped away Maybe you're on step one out of the will of God. Maybe you're on 56,249 step. But what do you do? What do you do when you've stepped away from God? Number one, listen, so many people, he's in a bad place right now. He's in a, a bad place. He is blind. And not only is his eyes gouged out, what they would do is they would burn them more accurately. They would burn his eye sockets and then scoop the rest of it out. That's what really happened. So he's in pain, he's in bondage, he's embarrassed, his head is shaved, he's as low as you can get. He's as low as you can get and he is disconnected from God. And listen, some of you are in, in this same boat. Some of you are, are, are a lot like Samson, I am at times. On the outside, some of you still have your hair. You have your hair. What I mean by that is, hey, on the outward appearance, you, you, you look like you're following Jesus. You look like that. You have your hair. But on the inside, you're so distant and disconnected. Because when you come to church, that's your hair. It looks like you've, you're on the outside, the outward, the exterior, you're doing it. But on the inside, you're far from him. And that's where he's at. But listen, here's the point I want to make. Brokenness is an open door to a breakthrough. Your brokenness is an open door to, to breakthrough. Some of y'all are just a step away from a breakthrough. Listen, when I see people that really go after what God has from them, it's usually preceded by brokenness. God has broken them with something, something in their life 
that God has convicted them with, they've responded. They're like, man, I am in a low place. And so many times, the breakthroughs happen after brokenness. And that's where some of you are. God has broken you. He has, he has allowed you to get to a place where you never thought you'd be. Maybe far from him, but that's where he responds. And I believe that's what God wants you to hear, if anything else, this morning. Is no matter how far you feel from God or how stuck you are and where you are, that in that brokenness, he opens a door that only he can open. And you begin to have a breakthrough. Finally, in your, your marriage, which seems so hopeless and far from God and what anything anybody could do, God starts to work through that in your finances when you begin to, to listen, turn from just how many steps away you are that you turn from that, that he responds to the prayer connected with that. He responds to your desperation. And that's what he wants you to do today. Now, so many of the natural response to being this far from God, how did I get here? My eyes gouged out. Or financially broken and busted and my, my spouse left me or we're on the verge. How did I get to this point? My kids don't listen. My job's not secure. There's $10 in the bank. How do I get this way? It was through a lot of little steps. A lot of little steps. Now, a lot of people struggle with regret. It's natural. Man, I wish I should have done this. When somebody invited me to church, man, I really should have seen that God was pursuing me. I see now I should have been obedient in these areas of my life, whether it was serving or giving or surrounding myself. God was trying to give me people that could support and love me and push me in the right direction and help me out. And I didn't. I didn't do those things. I made decisions that harmed not just me, but those disobedience always affects other people, right? And I wish I would. And regret is a natural response. But listen, you can't get stuck there. Because what God wants you is, is more than the regret. He wants you to, experience, he wants you to repent. And it's such a churchy word. I sometimes don't want to say it, but it's so important. It's key to you connecting with God. He just wants to repent. It just means, look, to go back and up, repent, like penthouse, back and up, back to where God calls you to be, which is up here. He called you to this, and you're repenting. God wants you his best for you, and it starts. Move quickly from regret. Okay, God forgives that. Move into repentance, and watch God move. So many times people think that their attendance, or their kind words, or that their time studying God's word, which is all great things, but it doesn't replace repentance. Repentance. It can't replace repentance. God, I'm sorry. I know you're not kicking me while I'm down. I'm hearing for the first time today that you love me so much that you gave Jesus, your son, probably your most favorite thing in the world. And you sent us Jesus. And I don't deserve that. But you did it anyway. There's no way I can pay you back for that. But God, I've, I've listen, I've recognized this. So many people recognize who God is and who Jesus is. They recognize that name. But listen, he doesn't just want us to recognize, he wants us to respond. The enemy recognizes God. The difference is responding. And what, what so many people miss that step of, man, he calls me, number one, to repent. God, I'm sorry. I know you've got greater things for me. You're the only one who can forgive my sins. Thank you, thank you, Jesus, for what you accomplished on the cross. You were the perfect sacrifice because you lived a perfect life, life because of what God loved us so much that he would send us Jesus. And not just to die on the cross, but especially to, to raise from the dead, to conquer death. That means he can conquer anything. You conquer death, you can lick anything. And God, more than just going to heaven, I want to make an impact on earth. I want to start with my family. And God, I realize that if I want to see change around me that only God can provide, it has to start with me. It has to start with me. So, he's public, publicly humiliated. And I want to show you the most, I think the most exciting and grace-filled piece of scripture in this whole 13 through 16. I want you to hear this. You'll miss it. You'll miss it. Ask God to let you hear this. It blew me away. Listen. As far away as he was from God, listen to verse 22. But the hair on his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. What that means, that means as much as he regretted 
There's something that happened to him. In his brokenness, he began to have a breakthrough. He began, because God allowed him to, to, to be in this situation, that he got there step after step after step. Nevertheless, the grace is God allowed that hair that represents his commit, commitment to God to grow back. Some of y'all are like, man, I wish he'd get me because I got this thing going on. This is grace here. It's saying, I'm allow, I allow you. When, you. when you have that breakthrough because you repent, recognize and respond and you repent, that I'll begin to, to bring you back to what I called you to be in the first place. Does that make sense to anybody? Okay. And this is what it says. It says, now the rulers of the Philistines assembled to offer a great uh, sacrifice to, to Dagon, their God, and to celebrate saying, hey, our God, Dagon, has delivered our enemy Samson into our hands. Remember, he had been at this, giving them a fit for 20 years. When the people saw him, they, they praised their God, saying, Our God has delivered him into our hands. And while they were in high spirits, they shouted, Bring out Samson to entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison. But God was working through him. He had begun to turn to God, and we'll see it right now. And God began to work through him. Listen, this isn't Samson, this is you. I hope you get that. That no matter how far we are from God and how far we feel from God, that when we begin to respond to Him through repentance, He begins to work again. He begins to change the circumstances. I mean, here's my last point. He's at the lowest point in his life, and this is what you've got to take home with you. If you're not dead, you're not done. If you're not dead, you're not done. God has something. If you've got breath in your lungs, God's got something he wants you to accomplish. He's got things, specific things that I don't know, but he does, and he wants to reveal them to you. And even though he's at this embarrassing low moment, probably close to death, he's not done, and he recognized this. And when they stood among the pillars, two pillars, two columns, probably two of many columns that held this, this giant place up way bigger than this gym, uh, that had stories to it, and uh, people would congregate there in the thousands and thousands. He's there and he had a servant that, that held his hand and got him around. He said, put me where I can feel the pillars so that I can uh, that support the temple, so that I can lean against them. I'm tired. I've been pushing this thing around. Now the temple was crowded with men and women. All were enemies of God. All the rulers uh, of, of the Philistines were there and on the roof were about 3,000 men and women watching Samson perform. They loved, listen, our enemy loves to see us suffer. He wants to devour us. And he seems to be in the hands of him, and he is. And they were watching this. As then Samson prayed to the Lord, O sovereign Lord, that means you know everything that's going on. You're in control of everything that's happening. O sovereign Lord, remember me, O God. Listen, Please strengthen me just once more. Listen, God had strengthened him a lot of times. And he kept relapsing, but he needed, listen, he needed one more time. Not just because he's about to die. Okay, I'll go ahead and take the end again. He's going to die. But some of you could pray that same thing to say, listen, God, listen, I am serious this time. God, you give me this one chance. I'm following. I'm following your son, Jesus. I don't need a thousand more chances. I need one more. I just need one. And God gives it to him. And he let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistines from my two eyes. Then Samson reached toward the two central pillars on the temple and stood bracing himself against them. His right hand on one, his left hand on the other. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. Then he pushed with all his might and down came the temple on the rulers and all the people in it. And here's what I want you to remember. What we said in the beginning is, look, our enemy, our enemy makes strong people weak, but our God makes weak men strong. And God fulfilled, despite his disobedience, all throughout what we read in Judges. Despite his disobedience, God was still working. We're still willing to use him. He's still willing to use you, no matter how far you are away from God, no matter how many wrong turns you've made. I mean, how many times you struck out or fouled out, failed, or that you fall? He's ready to use you. When you call on him, he responds. He responds to your brokenness. So our enemy makes strong people weak, but our God 
makes weak men strong. And here's what I want to do. It's time to push some pillars down for some people. Some of you in a position where something's got to give. I've got to push some things down in my life. There's things in my life that are interrupting, number one, my relationship with God. And anything that, listen, interrupts your relationship with God is going to interrupt your relationships, your marriage. It's going to interrupt the things that you cling on to so greatly, like your finances and your job, that stability. Listen, I'm telling you, I'm not trying to get political. I just want to see people saved, so I'm not going to get political. I'm called to be a pastor, not a, not a politician, right? But I'm going to say this. Satan loves for you to be dependent and put all your hope into a government. I don't care who you're voting for. But God's not going to have that. He wants you to be dependent on him. I want you to stand if you would. This is a very important time. Don't check out. Don't check out. So what pillars do you need to push down? What is in your life that you need to to push so that you can have victory so that you can ask God, God, I, these things in my life I can't manage but you can. You're sovereign. You're powerful. I need one more chance. I need one chance, God, despite my history, but despite my past. And some of you feel so guilty for things you've done in your life. You feel like, how can, any, how can anybody love me? How can God love me with the things that I've done and participated in? What is that pillar for you? What is it that's in the way? Because here's the deal. God is in, so crazy in love with you. He did send Jesus. He does love you. Jesus orchestrated for you to be here so you could hear his story. Look, Samson was supposed to be a judge that led the people back to God because here's the pattern in the Old Testament. The pattern was people served God and were doing what they were created to do. Then they would leave God. Things would distract them. And God would raise up somebody on several occasions to bring his people back to him. And he would lovingly accept them but then they would turn their back again he finally raised somebody that that did and that is Jesus perfect sinless Jesus that willingly died to please his father so that we could have life not just in heaven but on earth and, our, and, and he, he makes things new he does that so that we can be a new creation so we wouldn't have to limp around anymore with our past that we could hand that over to God so he could deal with it some of you lost your vision or you never had it to begin with you you've forgotten or have never known what God has called you to do but today you're hearing something for the first time I feel very confident that God is drawing you in I'd like for you to close your eyes just just don't look around please this is extremely private but there's something over the last couple of weeks or months that, man, God is speaking to you specifically. He's just talking to you. He's trying to move you around in your life. Would you raise your hand just so I can see? Yeah, God showed me something. Yes, all over. And me too. I get out there with you and raise both my hands. Yes. Amen. God is moving you to re listen. What I said earlier, he doesn't want you just to recognize him. Oh yeah, that's Jesus. Oh yeah, there's, there is a God. That is not what he wants. That's not what he died to do. He died so he can have a relationship with you, so that he could guide your steps. So you won't have to make those decisions that seem to always blow up in your face. He wants you to be spirit-led, and that only comes from knowing him. So that he can be with you. But it costs for you to repent. And it sounds like this. This is what it sounds like while your eyes are closed. Is, God, I'm sorry for not recognizing you and responding to you sooner, God. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for dying for my sins so that I could have life. God, I recognize that you raised from the dead so that I could have life. Change my circumstances. God, I repent. I turn away from my steps, whether you're on step one or 56,249, just turn. Just stop and turn. If you've never done that before and you just like for me to say a quick prayer, would you raise your hand just so I know? Just know I'm praying for you. Thank you. Don't fake me out. I love it. Let's pray for that. 
Father, thank you for your word, God, that pierces, God, piercing hearts and ears, God, people hanging on every word, God, hearing the hope that just spews from reading your word, God. God, you've put in thoughts and next steps for people, God, that they need, Lord, to serve, to give, to connect with people, God, so that they can live out what you call them to do, God. We've all taken wrong turns, God, and we're, we're all responsible, Lord, for, for sinning and, and, to, and pointing people in the wrong directions with the way we live our life, God, but you, you are so for, quick to forgive, God. You're so quick to accept this back. You're so loving to give us a, a new life, God, to trade this one in, God. Thanks for salvaging our life, God. Thank you for giving us a new opportunity. God, it only comes from knowing you, God. And God, you save us so that we can do your work, Lord, so that we can have an urgency for other people the way you did and do. And God, we'd ask immediately that you, pl that you place these people, Lord, in situations where they can give hope to people so that they can turn to you, God. They can see our response to you, God, and be inspired to to hear from you, God, and respond for themselves. Thank you for a church, Lord, that loves people, that values people, that serves people. God, that invests in people. God, thank you for purging attitudes, God. Thank you for purging our preferences, God, that, that we can, that, that take our focus off of you, God. We never want to lose our vision for this church and this community and this area. I thank you for lives changed this week and today, God. I thank you that that you never abandon us. God, that you never walk away, Lord. That you're constant and consistent. All the things that so many things and people in our life are not. We give you full credit, God. And for that, we're going to worship you now, God. We're going to sing to you and about you. God, for the first time, for so many, this, they'll finally be able to mean the words that they see on the screen, God, and help them to, to move to a place of worship, to recognize that they were created to worship you, Lord, in song and in their life, with their money and their time, their efforts, where you have them planted right now, God. Help them to, everybody, Lord, to, to work what's in front of them, God, just to maximize the opportunity you give them right now, Lord, so that you can give them more, so that you can put more in their life, Lord, that you can promote them to where you want them to be, God. Thank you for allowing this church to be a vessel for that, an opportunity for that. God, people today, God, are praying uh, impossible prayers, God, but none are impossible for you. They're in deep, dark places, God, and they don't know where to go or what to do, but they know, God, they're hearing today and they're going to test you, God. They want to bring it to you, God. They need you to move. God, they need comfort in their life. They need direction. They need contentment. They need peace. And Lord, you're faithful to provide, God, and help us to seek all those things through you, Lord, and nothing else. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you clap for people that made major decisions in their life today? Thank you for hearing God's word. Listen, I never think that, that, that when we read and speak of God's Word that, that it ever just bounces off the people and doesn't affect them. I know maybe you didn't raise your hand. Maybe you, to say that, man, there's, I'm saved, but I got stuff going on in my life. Or maybe you didn't raise your hand uh, that, man, oh, I've never received Christ like I do that today. Maybe you weren't one of those people. That's okay. But listen, we have people that's going to pray for you now. They're going to make their way over here. I'm going to be back here, but I'm nothing special. But I'll be glad to pray with you. I love it. And so you might want to do different things. I don't want to handcuff you with what God's called you to do. If you need to pray here, but listen, if you're going to bring it here, you need to leave it here. You need to hand it off to God. Maybe you're going to do that same thing in your seat, okay? Maybe where you are. Some of y'all are going to sing. You're going to see people raising their hands. They're maybe saying, I'm surrender. You know, just like you surrender. I surrender these things in my life. God, I'm yours. I'm not going to fight it. Okay? And listen, ignore the people around you. Just ignore them. You're created to worship, and that's what this time's for. And so I'm going to get out of the way and let you do what God's called you to do. Pray about what God's laid on your heart today and respond. Don't just recognize it, but respond. Lord, we worship you now. We give you full control. In Jesus' name, amen. One more hand clap.
All right.